Good evening. A very warm welcome to Chatham House. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm the director. We're delighted to be having this conversation with Rahul Gandhi. Ben Bland, who is head of our Asia program, is going to be moderating it. And please get your questions ready online or here in the audience. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of them. It's a privilege to have Rahul Gandhi here today. We spend a lot of time talking about India and at Davos and the Munich Security Conference recently. There was almost no question that came up as often as what India might want, what it is going to do, how the world might respond to what it's doing. It is, of course, the year when uh, it has become the most populous nation on earth. That is one of the things prompting the, uh, those comments. But so is its uh, leadership of the G20 this year and the many difficult, tactical, diplomatic questions it has in steering its way through that and the membership of the G20. And at home, as we know and as we're about to hear, there are many questions as well from climate change and food insecurity to intercommunal divisions and inequality. Rahul Gandhi needs very little introduction. He comes from one of India's preeminent political families. He's been a member of parliament since 2004. He was the president of the Indian National Congress, the main opposition party, from 2017 to 2019. He comes to the UK having recently completed a 4,000 kilometer walk across India to listen to the concerns of voters in the world's biggest democracy. Very glad to have you here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Bronwyn, and thanks, Mr. Gandhi, uh, for joining us today, and thank you all for arriving so promptly. Um, just a reminder before we get going that we are in Chatham House, but this event is on the record. It's not being held under the Chatham House rule, and it is being live streamed as well. Um, if you're watching on Zoom and you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box, and I will save plenty of time in the room as well to take your questions later on. Um, but for now, let's just get straight on with the Q&A, Mr. Gandhi, and maybe we can start with your walk across India. I think it was called the Bharat Jodo Yatra, right? Is that the Unite India March? Or yeah. is that the correct translation? You walked 4,000 kilometers through 14 states, um, I think 146 days. Um, you only finished in, in January. So why don't you start by telling us why you did this walk and what you learned? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, when I joined politics um, 2004, the democratic contest in India used to be between political parties. And I had never imagined at that time uh, that the nature of the contest would change completely. It was, it was, I mean, if you had even told me at that time, I would have, I would have said that it was a ridiculous thing to say. But the nature of the democratic contest in India has completely changed. And the reason it's changed is because one organization called the RSS, um, fundamentalist fascist organization, has basically captured pretty much all of Indian, India's institutions. And maybe for those who don't know, can you explain what the RSS is? RSS, RSS is a, you can call it a secret society. Um, it, it's built along the lines of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the idea is to use the democratic contest to come to power and then subvert the democratic contest afterwards. Um, and it shocked me at how successful they've been at capturing the different institutions of our country. Uh, the press, uh, the judiciary, parliament, uh, election commission, all the institutions are under pressure, under threat, and uh, controlled in one way or the other. So the, so the conversation, the voice uh, that was free-flowing, the debates, those have all stopped. Um, you know, some of the biggest decisions taken 
demonetization, which is demonetization of the Indian currency. We were not allowed to debate in parliament. Right? Uh, the farmers' bills where large numbers of farmers were out in the street, we were not allowed a conversation in parliament. Um, the GST, we were not allowed. When Chinese troops entered our territory, we were not allowed to have a conversation in parliament. So that stifling made us ask ourselves a fundamental question. Uh, how do we communicate with the people of India when the media um, is biased, when the institutions uh, are captured? And the answer we came up with in the Congress party was this walk across the country, which has a tradition. Um, the word is yatra, it's journey. Uh, but it's not simply a journey. It's, it's an it's a Indian idea of walking, of persevering, of listening, and of questioning oneself. And so we, we decided to do this. It was 4,000 kilometers. And uh, it was quite an experience. It was a fun experience, painful at times. Um, but we all learned a lot. And it placed on the table a different narrative of India, right? Um, not an angry, aggressive, violent narrative, uh, which is currently uh, deployed by the BJP, but a peace-loving, almost Gandhian, non-violent, open, accepting narrative. And I think that was the biggest success of the Yatra, that it clearly placed on the, on the table a different vision of the country. And what did you learn while you were sort of traversing you know, the many diverse states of India, um, mobbed by people at different learned stages many, along the way? We learned many, many things. Um, well, the first thing I learned um, was that listening, um, especially listening to people, large numbers of people, uh, is something very powerful. And I realized that as a politician, uh, before my walk, I was not actually listening properly, right? Um, as politicians, we always, we start by telling you what we think. And we have a narrative in our mind and, you know, whenever somebody says something, that narrative is shaping our conversation. Maybe we want to uh, impress a little bit and say we understand, you know, what you're trying to get at. So that instinct went silent. It went silent because, frankly, I had no choice. One, I had a knee problem, so my mind was like trying to calm my knee down. Um, and second, the number of people was so big that it was no point. So I, after some time, I just went silent and I started to listen properly. And it was a very powerful experience for me. Taught me patience. And there was huge pressure. I mean, to give you an idea, six people died in the walk. Uh, many people broke their legs, arms, uh, because there was huge pressure of people. There were thousands, at, at times, 50, 100,000 people walking. So it was a physical experience. Uh, the other thing I learned is that no amount of exercise makes you lose weight. It's like a completely a myth. I mean, at the end of this thing, 4,000 kilometers, I go on the scale and I put on a kilo. I mean, so, so I'm like, okay. So it's, it's totally diet. It's nothing to do with exercise. That's the other thing I learned. Yeah. And how, how has the, the walk been received politically? I mean, obviously, you, you did it for the reasons you said, but you're also a politician. You're seeking to win public support. There are national elections coming up in India. What, what's your sense in terms of how it's been received in terms of your own political position and, and Congress's position in, in India? It's, it's, it's transformational. Um, it's transformational certainly for the party because it gave tremendous energy, energy to our party workers. But it's also, it was also transformational for a lot of the people who are coming. And the powerful thing about it was the physical contact and the scale of the physical contact. And it was something 
you know, I've been to thousands of meetings, uh, public meetings, um, conversations like this. Uh, it's a completely different thing. Because when you're, when you're walking, um, and you're walking with, say, a farmer, or you're walking with, uh, with uh, a young woman, there's a struggle going on. Particularly if you're walking 25, 30 kilometers a day, there's a struggle going on. And you sort of are jointly going through that thing, <coughs> right? So it's a completely different conversation that happens. The other thing I did, which I think helped a lot, was right in the beginning, I got the guys I work with and I said, look, uh, what is my responsibility here? You know, what is mine and, and your responsibility here? We are walking 4,000 kilometers, and that's all fine. But what is it that we will not accept in this walk? And I told them that, look, what I want, and there was a rope there, so I don't know if you saw, did you see the video? You didn't see the video? Yeah, I see. Yeah, so there's a rope there, and there's quite a lot of security around the rope. So I told the guys that, look, whoever comes into this area to talk to us, and there were 125 of us walking, so it wasn't just me. Uh, I was in front, but there was 125, and these conversations were going on with everybody. And I said, look, whoever comes in, he doesn't matter who he is, who she is, that person's got to feel at home, right? And the feeling I want us to generate is that when they leave this place, they feel that they've left home. So in my mind, it was not a political exercise. In my mind, it was a personal exercise where I was welcoming people like into this room and giving them a space to feel comfortable and talk, and also making it a personal talk, not a political talk. And we were successful at doing that because there was a lot of pressure, security people pushing and pulling. And so we, we created this sort of cocoon there where anybody came in, felt comfortable, and then some magic started to happen. Because the moment they started to see this, that there's this connection in the 21st century where you know, we're not going through the WhatsApp or we're not going through Facebook and all that, and there's this gentleman who's come here and these people who've come here, and they're talking to us, then it, the nature of the conversation changed completely. And most shocking conversations started to happen. Like, the most personal things suddenly people were discussing with a, with a stranger, really, you know? So it became almost like a, uh, like a, either a friend or a brother, you know? That, that was the type of conversation. So a lot of stuff came up. And you've, you've talked a lot um, previously about the attacks on democracy in India. Um, at a time when I guess there's a sense that globally democracy is under pressure. I mean, do you see any linkages there? Do you think there is some sort of global shift against democracy that's affecting or partly driving what's been happening in India? Or do you see the challenges in India as being pretty endogenous to India's particular political environment? They're linked for sure. Uh, but each country has its own history, its own philosophy, its own uh, way of thinking about these things. So. Um, definitely, there are two sort of visions of the planet emerging. I mean, that to me is clear. There's a sort of free, democratic, open, open space idea, and then there's a sort of more controlled, coercive idea, and that 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 is visible. India has. There are some nuances to it in India, right? Uh, First of all, it's not, a, it's not a battle between political parties anymore. It's, it's a battle between two old ideas of India and philosophical ideas of India, uh, which are diametrically opposed, different. Um, and the BJP represents one and we, we represent the other. Uh, in India also, there's the, the matter of caste. Right, which, is, which doesn't exist, for example, in uh, England or the United States. It's a very particular uh, aspect of society. So it's, it's, it plays out differently, but it's sort of informed by what's going on in the rest of the world. And 
I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're a politician, you've, you've pinned a lot of the blame for what's happening on BJP and Narendra Modi's government, but would you, are there bottom-up drivers, do you think, in India I, as well? I, I don't, it's not that I pin the blame on them, it's that I feel they operationalize it, right? So they, they are the mechanism through which it's happening. But I said in my, in my Cambridge talk that I think the problem, well, when we walked, we, we, we heard basically three things, well, four things, uh, unemployment, price rise, inequality, and violence against women. Those are the broad themes that came out. But the real, the real problem is the unemployment problem, right? And that's generating a lot of anger and a lot of fear. And I think the unemployment problem is happening because earlier, if you look at the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, there was a concept of production in the democratic environment, right? Uh, countries like Britain, countries like India, America, they produce things, and uh, there, was, there was manufacturing, there was production going on. And then for whatever reason, that was parceled out to China, right? And today we live in a world where there is a production model in the coerc coercive environment, but there is no production model in the democratic environment. So the result is that it becomes very difficult for democratic countries to give their youngsters employment. I, I don't believe that a country like India um, can employ all its people with services. I just, I just don't believe it. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have the connectivity, it doesn't have the structure that can deliver you those jobs. So to me the question is, can a democratic production model be rebuilt, and what does it look like, right? And I think that's at the center of what is creating the problem. And the problem is manifesting in different places differently. In India, it's, it's manifesting along caste lines, along religious lines. I think we might, we might come back to that economic question later if we have time on economic models, but obviously, you know, the BJP would say to you that you're just, you're, you're looking for excuses for why Congress hasn't been able to cut through, um, you know, so you blame the kind of the playing field being unfair. And I guess there's certainly a point there that Congress and its coalition partners have struggled to cut through, given what you're saying about the scale of the problems that, that people are facing. So what, why do you think that's been, that you've struggled on, on the national stage to get that cut through? And how do you think you might be able to change that, you know, leading up to the next no, national first elections? Of all, to put it in perspective, right, if you look at... Uh, if you look at the time from independence to now, the Congress party has been in power for majority of the time, right? So it's not that, it's not that the BJP has been in power, uh, before the BJP was in power for 10 years, we were in power for 10 years, right? And so it's not, it's not I mean, the BJP likes to believe that they've come to power in India and they're gonna be in power eternally, you know? That's not the case, right? But uh, there, there is a, there is a, set of changes that are taking place in India. And uh, the Congress party and the UPA in its time uh, were caught by those changes, right? The biggest, the biggest change is that India is moving from a rural uh, country, rural uh, yeah, country to an urban country, right? And that changes the nature of the political discourse. That changes the nature of, of uh, the, the, the structure. And we, we were focusing a lot on the rural space, and we missed the ball in the beginning on the urban space. And that, that's a fact, right? So those things are there. Uh, but to say that now the BJP is in power and you know, the Congress is gone, I, I mean, that, that's actually a ridiculous, ridiculous idea. Um, and as far as the coercion, the violence that is concerned, it's not the Congress that's saying it. Congress is saying it, but you just got to travel in India and see it. I mean, you can see what's being done to the Dalit community, or you can see what's being done to the tribal community. You can see what's being done to the minorities. Um, it's, not, it's not that the Congress is saying it and objectively it's not being seen. There are articles all across uh, in, in the foreign press all the time that there is a serious problem with Indian democracy, right? Uh, it's, also, it's also 
the way the the BJP responds, right? The it's not interested in a conversation. They've decided that they know what's going on. Nobody else in the country understands what's going on. And that's it. And this is visible. I mean, you can ask any opposition party. Um, you can see, for example, how the agencies are used. You can ask any opposition leader about how the agencies are used. Uh, my phone had Pegasus on it. That simply was not happening uh, when we were in power. So they, they, there are things that are very obvious and are apparent to everybody. And, and when we go beyond kind of the next election or the ele election after that and think a bit bigger about India's future, I think you described India really nicely as sort of ongoing negotiation between different states and, and peoples. And obviously the intercommunal tensions are not a new phenomenon in India, but how, how does India move beyond that to a kind of a better, more peaceful, smoother kind of negotiation in the next decades? Yeah, so, I mean, one way of looking at India is that it's a country. And another way of looking at it is that it is a negotiation between uh, 1.4 billion people, right? And that negotiation, um, if you imagine India, um, in terms of numbers, it's probably three times Europe, three times the United States. Um, it's probably got as many languages as Europe does. Uh, it's certainly got as many histories as Europe does. And that negotiation is a complex negotiation. And that negotiation happens, it doesn't happen um, out in the streets. It happens through institutions. It happens through the parliament, it happens through assemblies, it happens through the courts, it happens through the election commission, right? And my worry is that the architecture of that negotiation is being attacked and broken, right? Um, and you can see, you can see sort of the symptoms, right? Um, the prime minister one day turns around and demonetizes the entire currency, right? The, the Reserve Bank doesn't know about it. And he's, everything has been bypassed on something as fundamental as the currency of the country. That's an example. And it's the same way the GST was worked out. Right? So you can see that, that the reliance on those institutions is reducing. And that, to me, is, a, is, is very, very dangerous. Right? So certainly there's repair work that needs to be done right? on, on the idea of freedom, on the idea of independent institutions. There's a whole bunch of repair work that needs to be done. And then I think uh, fundamental to a successful India is the decentralization of power. So what is happening, what you see, the trend you see is massive concentration of wealth and power. Right? And that's, if you really look at the BJP and see what's the one big thing that they've done, it's huge concentration of power in the prime minister's office and then huge concentration of wealth in the hands of two or three people. Right? And that, to me, a country the size of India simply cannot be run like that. Right? So that, to me, the decentralization, uh, supporting small and medium businesses, starting or reimagination, reimagining um, production, manufacturing in a modern way, in a decentralized way, in a technological way. And I think their linkages between the West and India are critical. I want to pivot a bit here to foreign policy and start with India and China. And I know you're a keen follower of, of, of China. And obviously, in the last few years, we've seen these flare-ups at the border, seemingly driven by China. Um, there was a trajectory previously where Xi Jinping and, and Modi seemed to be getting on well. They had their sort of tea meeting in, in Wuhan. Why, why do you think in the last few years Beijing has decided to antagonize India? Because it seems to have really pushed India well, I mean, towards the West. Uh, an antagonize is sort of a, a benign word. I mean, they're sitting on 2,000 square kilometers of our territory. Right? I mean, I don't know. That, antagonize doesn't quite capture it. Right? No? I mean, uh, yeah, it doesn't quite capture it. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that when they did it, our prime minister said uh, in a meeting with the opposition where I was there, 
uh, that not a single inch of Indian territory has been taken. Right? Now, what message does that send to the Chinese? Right? The Chinese know they're sitting on 2,000 square kilometers of our territory. Our military knows it. And our prime minister says, well, they're not there. So it encourages them. Right? So that's, that's one aspect of the problem. As a, as a country, our ethos and our DNA is democratic, right? I mean, you, there's the book, The Argumentative Indian, uh, by Mr. Amartya said, we just like to talk and you know, spend a lot of time talking and discussing things. And that's the way we build consensus, because it's very complex. And so we in the Congress are pretty clear that whatever is going to be built, whatever is going to happen, has to be in a, in a democratic, in an open um, structure. And that, of course, that's not China, right? So, so we are much more comfortable with the democratic idea, that open idea. Of course, at the same time, they're, they're our neighbor, and we're in competition with them. And frankly, um, if we're going to talk about production, right, we are the biggest game in town. And so they see us as a problem, right? So my approach is they are offering a vision of, product, uh, of productivity, of prosperity. Well, we should have a vision of prosperity too. And that includes the West and India. But that's missing. So to me, that's, that's where the work needs to be done. Um, it seems to me that as, as someone who's you know, lived a long time in Asia and watched the politics play out, it's going to be very hard to have a successful, productive Asian century if India and China are, are at loggerheads. So how can you foresee a rapprochement uh, between India and China, and how, how might that happen? How could that happen? I mean, I don't know about uh, rapprochement, but. I do think that we have to have a vision for production, right? And I don't think it's going to look like the Chinese one. Uh, it can't. Uh, structurally, we can't do that, right? So it's got to be a decentralized one. And, and I think you are going to have a level of competition between the, uh, the two countries. There is going to be, on the margins, there's going to be a little bit of tension, a little bit uh, of hostility. But I think it's very important that the lines are clear. I mean, they're sitting on 2,000 square kilometers of our territory. Right? That's the fact. So what would, a, what would a Congress government do about that? Well, I mean, we'd have to, we'll have to see when we're, we're, when we're there in power. But, but I, think, I think making things clear, and certainly, certainly not denying that they're sitting in your territory to start with, and so you spoke earlier about sort of different visions of the world, and I guess a, a US-led vision you're implying, and maybe a, a China-led one. But what's, what would an India-led world look like? Is it, is it very similar to the sort of Western democratic ideals? Know. Is it something very different? I don't know if it's, I don't know if, I don't quite like the word led, right? Um, I think it's a joint effort. Right? And I think there are components that the United States has, there are components that Britain has, there are components that India has, and they're valuable. Right? So I think I don't, I don't like the idea that, oh, that, that's being led by that person, this is being led by that person. I, I like the idea of, of a bridge. So how can we imagine a bridge, uh, a bridge of prosperity between these systems and these ideas, where we have a role to play, we bring a lot to the table. You bring a lot to the table, right? And let's have a conversation about what those things are and how we can put it into practice, right? Um, yeah, I think, I think the world is, in the 21st century, is, is connected enough where, you know, the word led is, is problematic. So is, is, is it then that you're envisaging some, some more sort of more multipolar 
order where... Well, of course, the United it, States is more powerful, right? So one cannot deny that the United States is powerful. Uh, but, but everybody is required. You can't, you can't in the 21st century say, you know, we're going to exclude you. That, that's not a possibility. So now what would, an Indi what would the Indian elements of that bridge look like? Uh, a successful, in my view. Um, it, would, it would invoke the ideas of Mahatma Gandhi. It would be uh, nonviolent. It would be sensitive. Um, it would stand for some of those values, uh, which India is very good at, at doing. It would respect other cultures. It would not be aggressive. It would try to listen to other perspectives. We're good at doing that. I mean, we have, in our, in our philosophical structure, we have these ideas. You know? We have this idea um, called shunyata, right? Zero, non-existence. So that can absorb everything. So, so those are the type of ideas that I would say that India brings to the table. And I want to ask about Ukraine, because it's obviously a, a massive issue you know, in Europe. Um, I think, by and large, Congress has supported, if I'm, if I'm right in this, the, the Modi government's position of neutrality um, at the UN when it comes to, to the war in, in Ukraine. I mean, how, how do you think that stands with you know, India's position as a, as a democracy and wanting to provide democratic leadership and upholding you know, the ideals of freedom and sovereignty? I mean, I would agree with the, the foreign policy on that, on that issue. And there's, there's also an element of national interest. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, there are interests. We have to look after our interests. So, so they're there. But I'm against any type of war. I'm against any type of violence. And the sooner it ends, the better it is. And as far as the 21st century is concerned, uh, a war like Ukraine with the potential for unlimited escalation is just downright dangerous. And we should be very careful that, that it's playing out in Europe. And everybody should try and do their bit to stop it. And could you see a time when India does start to move away from Russia? Obviously, that's one of the reasons why you know, India is, is wary of, of criticizing Russia, because it relies on, on Russia for you know, a large part of its military equipment and technology. But obviously, at the same time, the West has been courting India, in part because of you know, the, the issues that you have with China. And we see the existential threat um, from China. So do you, could you foresee this shift happening over time? I mean, look, uh, self-interest is important. And then you know, you're saying courting. I don't know. How, how well are you courting? <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> That's up to you, you know, how well, how well you court India. Yeah. So, and could you could you ever envisage an India that does move away from multi-alignment or non-alignment to kind of hard depends, alliances? No, I don't know. I don't. I don't think about it like that. I think, uh, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Right. Start from there. What is our problem? Our problem is we've got a huge population, and we need to give them jobs. We need to give them livelihood we need to give them an imagination. <laughs> and that's our primary job. Now, we will do whatever it takes to make that happen. And the best route to make it happen is what we'll be doing. We're not going to do anything that will uh, damage the aspirations of our own people. We're not going to do something that is going to uh, you know, damage their employment prospects. So every country looks at itself looks at the problems it's trying to solve, and then works from there, right? I'm going to come to audience questions in a minute, just a couple more. I mean, firstly, on the economy. I mean, it seems to me that the, the model of industrialization um, and manufacturing, export-led growth that you know, was very successful for Japan, Korea, Singapore in, in driving them to rich country status, doesn't really work anymore because of changes in you know, the rise of automation, potentially because of the fracturing of global value chains and some sort of shaving away of the benefits of globalization. So 
for India as well, which is such a big country, such a big domestic market and big challenges to employ its, its young people as well, what is the model do you see going forward for India to achieve the sort of rapid growth but also more equitable growth that, that your country needs? In my, in my walk, um, I walk, I walk past a town called Bellari in Karnataka. And uh, I literally walk past it. And some people over there said, look, this is a genes producing center. OK? Uh, and please come and see what we're doing. So I spent half a day walking around Bellari and looking at this genes production um, that they were doing. It used to employ five lakh people. So five lakh is half a million, right? Today, it employs 40,000 people. Right? Uh, it's essentially a network of skill. Right? Whenever you walk in there, there are people who have huge amount of skill sitting there. And they're doing nothing. Right? So the question is, how can we take their skill and make them produce something? Right? And then make that accessible to people. Right? And those centers exist all across India. There's Bellari, Moradabad, everywhere. They're, they're almost, almost every district in India has a skill base uh, that is profound. Right? But then what do we do? Or what is happening today? Uh, huge concentration of wealth, huge concentration, complete control of the banking system by three or four uh, large industrialists, and the skills just lying there, wasting, wasting away. Those four and a half lakh people today are unemployed, right? That, that, that Bellari itself, if it's aligned properly, if the banking system is made accessible to them, if you inject technology into, into that skill, skill space, that thing, you'll be able to produce a million jobs there, right? So I don't agree that manufacturing per se is dead, right? I, I look at it by saying, OK, here is the skill. What do we need now to make sure that this skill translates into jobs? Right? And then there's, there, uh, there are different areas. I'm not saying that there is no space for large business. Absolutely, there is space for large business. But the level of monopolization that is taking place today is seriously problematic. It's problematic if you want to transform, if you want to give Indian people jobs. It's problematic if you want to have a productive vision for the country. Right? So also, uh, there's a huge scope for agriculture. Right? Building a cold chain, modernizing the agricultural uh, system. Uh, it's huge potential. It's wasted right now. So those are the type of things that one would look at. Okay. Um, last question I have before I go to the questions from the floor and online. You talked a lot on this trip and probably before as well about listening. And I agree with you, listening is an underrated quality in politics and diplomacy where most people prefer talking. So given we've got you here and we're all keen to listen, and you've been in the UK, I think, for, for a week or so now, what do you think we in the UK get most wrong about India? What don't we see that we should no, to better understand India. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm going to give away the secret. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like the quote I saw in your room, right? The Gorbachev quote. Uh, the Gorbachev quote was to the, to the effect of, we are at a very important time in history. And there are two options. One option is uh, this one, and the other option is this one. That's just not how the Indian mind sees the world. Right? The Indian mind just does not see the world in a binary way. So for the Indian person, number one, we are not at a critical point in history. Right? And number two, there's thousands of options standing right in front of us. That's just, that's just how the Indian mind works. And it, it translates, if you look at, if you just go to Delhi, and you look at the street, and you look at the lane, 
lanes. You'll see Indian drivers making their way through this thing, right? They'll go this way, they'll go that way. Now, that's, that looks like chaos, right? But in the 21st century, that chaos is very powerful. But that chaos has to be managed effectively. Thanks. That's, that's a very good, very good answer. Um, OK, I'll tell you something else. Yeah. If, you can, if, you can, if, you can, if you can, this is a concept that's difficult. Mm. And I'll try it. Um, broadly, there are two philosophies in India. One believes in infinity, right? That says you will live forever, right? And the other that says you don't exist. Concept of shunyata or anatta in Buddhism, right? Uh, and India, India operates between these two, right? The idea of non-existence, or anatta is in Buddhism, is the essence of listening. So if I'm sitting here talking to you, and I don't exist, right? that is absolutely the perfect way to listen to you. What do I mean by I don't exist? It means my aspirations don't exist. It means my fears don't exist. It means, you know, I am sitting almost in silence, almost as if I'm dead and I'm listening to you. That's something Indian people can do. It's a very powerful thing, right? And if you look at our, so to speak, the grandmasters, people like Gandhi, that's actually what they're doing, right? And that's a, it's a philosophical thing, but it's the, it's the power of the Indian civilization. It's why, it's where, you know, the West got zero from. Yeah. Right, and then that, and then that, no, but you're laughing, but then, then when that zero arrives in the West, it completely transforms and does something that it can't do in India, right? Because when it comes into contact with your philosophy, the sum of both those things is much bigger than either of them. So to me, that's how I see it. I think, I mean, I used to sit on a table when I was small, uh, and my grandmother and my mother's father used to sit there uh, at lunchtime, and they used to speak to each other, and I would just look at them, and they were two different worlds, right? My, my grandmother would be speaking something else, saying something, meaning something else, and my grandfather would be understanding something else, but the conversation was going on. And that, to me, is, is, is the essence of the thing, which is that I look at you and I say, he has ideas that are actually powerful and useful for me. And in turn, I have ideas that might be powerful and useful for him. And I think that's, the, that's what's important in the 21st century. <coughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. Listening is, is great. Um, way, as, as a final thing, sorry. As a final thing, uh, I, I am a practitioner, and I, I, I'm sort of in the, I deal in power, right? And I can tell you that, and this is something, it's a bit hard to grasp. Listening is much more powerful than speaking. There's no comparison between the two. But for some reason, people are convinced that speaking is more powerful, right? Even if you're speaking to me and I'm listening to you, I understand what you're gonna do, right? I can predict what you're gonna do if I listen carefully. Um, yeah, so many questions. Uh, the gentleman at the front, if you can tell us who you are and any affiliation. And yeah, the mic's coming to you. 
And please uh, keep it to a question, not a statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hanif Adil, former advisor, British Parliament, British Government. Um, the question, I'm going to come to the question. I just want to make one point. No point, sorry, just a okay. question. Okay. Uh, it's contextual, questions. okay. Rahulji, thank you very much for your very sobering analysis. Clearly, the comparison between the RSS and the Muslim Brotherhood is an interesting one. The fact is, the BJP have captured the narrative and the institutions in a way that most people would have thought that they could not have. So clearly, listening, all the things you're doing are great. But in terms of a clinical approach, what would be your short to medium term plan in terms of projecting what you stand for, what your party stands for, what you want to achieve with the grassroots? And because you're taking on somebody who is a populist, who clearly has support, who's captured the, the whole state effectively. That's my question, thank you. I think, I think the walk that we did in the last four and a half months is a, is a powerful model. And I think it, uh, it brings in a lot of the ingredients of a response to uh, what you're talking about. And I think uh, it works for most of the opposition in India. It's acceptable to most of the opposition in India. So reaching out to the people in interesting ways and making sure that you're having a direct connect with people and, and building a new imagination, I think is, is central uh, to fighting the BJP. Also, don't underestimate the resistance. You know, um, authoritarian people try, like to like to demonstrate how powerful they are and how strong they are. Uh, the resistance in India is also very strong and very powerful, um, and and can do wonders. And the lady in the cream jumper just behind. But but, but you know what? If we step back from the BJP Congress conversation. What India is, what's actually happening is a huge transition in India, right? Oh, huge migration of people. And India is now searching for a new model with which to engage with its people and the rest of the world, right? And what's pretty clear is that the BJP model is not it. Because it's creating much too much turbulence, much too much resistance. So the real challenge that people like me and other leaders in the opposition have is what does that thing look like? Mr. Gandhi, thank you for your candor and your plain speaking. You've spoken about democracy in trouble. You spoke about it just now. You spoke about it yesterday. And you expressed some surprise at the fact that Western European countries don't seem to have noticed that large chunks of democracy were falling away. So here's my question to Pata. One, what are you, you, the Congress party, but you also the opposition planning to do about this? And part two, what would you like London, Paris, Berlin, all the other capitals, the governments and the people to do about this? No, look, uh, first of all, this is, it's our problem. Right? It's an internal problem. It's an Indian problem. And the, the solution is going to come from inside. It's not going to come from outside. Um, however, the scale of Indian democracy means that democracy in India is a global public good. Right? It impacts way further than our boundaries. Um, if, if, India, if Indian democracy collapses, in my view, um, democracy on the planet suffers a very serious, possibly fatal blow. So it's important for you too. It's not just important for us. We'll deal with our problem. But you must be aware that this problem is going to play out at a global scale. It's not just going to play out in India. Right? And, and what you do about it 
is of course up to you. But you must be aware that in what is happening in India, the idea of a democratic model is being attacked and threatened. I'm going to ask an online question, quite a pointed one, uh, from Saeed Bajral Hassan, um, who says, would Mr. Gandhi agree that dynastic politics has by and large impeded the growth of democracy in South Asia, in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh? I mean, I think uh, impeded the growth of politics. Of democracy, democracy in South Asia. No, I think, I think the structures that are, that are playing out and are impeding democracy are much more structural um, and, and way beyond uh, dynastic politics, I mean. Okay, um, gentlemen at the front here. Thank you. Hi, Rahul. Uh, I had a question around and China. Tell us who you are, sorry. Sorry, my name is Bharat. I'm from uh, Rio Tinto. And um, Bharat. The Bharat, yes. Uh, the question I had was around China. I think you're on record saying that you know, this government doesn't quite understand the nature of the risk that China poses. And I'm just curious to understand what, in your estimation, is exactly the nature of that risk. And fundamentally, what are these guys not getting? Thank you. If you look at um, what has happened in Ukraine, right? the basic principle of Ukraine, the basic principle that has been applied in Ukraine uh, is that the Russians have told the Ukrainians that we do not accept the relationship you have with Europe and America. And if you do not change this relationship, we will change your territory. We will, we will, we will challenge your territorial integrity. Right? In my view, that is what is happening on the borders of my country. What China is threatening China does not want us to have a relationship with the United States. And it is threatening us by saying, if you continue to have this relationship with the United States, we will take action. And that's why they've got troops in Ladakh, and that's why they've got troops in Arunachal Pradesh. So in my view, the basic idea behind the troops in Arunachal and uh, Ladakh is similar to what is happening in um, Ukraine. I mentioned this to the foreign minister. He completely disagrees with me. And he thinks this is a ludicrous idea. It's fine. We have a different opinion. Yeah, the lady in the third row, in, in brown jumper. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, yes, <laughs> no, it's me, thank you very much. My name is Malani Mehra, and I run an international parliamentary organization that works on climate change. But my question is um, raised with, to you as a citizen of India. There are many of us in the international diaspora. There are something more than 20 million Indians in the international di diaspora. You spoke about the need for India to address these issues by itself, not within its own borders, because you have the international diaspora. And many people like myself no, no which, longer... Sorry, I didn't. Which, which issues? The environmental issues? No, the issues facing India. The, democratic despair that the country is in. So here is my question. And I ask it as someone who is one of possibly millions who no longer recognizes the country that they were born and raised in. And we would like to know I mean, what your message is. Is that, a, is that a bad thing or a good thing? What do you think? No, I'm asking you. Why Just, am I here? I don't know. I'm here because I'm I am a... feeling wretched about the state of my country. Yeah. Absolutely wretched. My father was an RSS man, proudly so. He would not recognize the country, bless his soul. So for those of us who are outside of India, how can we engage? How can we re-empower our democracy? 20 years ago, I worked with Professor Amartya Sen. And Amartya didn't let go okay, of his passport. Question, I'm not please. getting rid of my passport. And I want to know what can we do to reanimate our democratic institutions? 
Well, I like, I like your, your energy. Uh, no, I, it's very important. It's very important. Uh, and it's, it goes to the point of the resistance. You see, the resistance is sitting here. Um, no, I, I meant that the battle, the battle for the democratic institutions of India is, frankly, India's responsibility and no one else's, right? And it's, it's something that uh, we are doing. But you, of course, are Indian. So it's your responsibility as well. And you're, you're part of that uh, discussion. I think when you express yourself, I think what you said about your father being in the RSS and about him not recognizing our country uh, in this conversation itself is a very powerful thing. Uh, because uh, for me to say it, uh, people might feel, ah, he's fighting the RSS, he's fighting the BJP, he might be biased, right? But for you to say it, uh, it has a totally different impact. So you're already, you're, by expressing yourself and by making your position clear, you're already helping in a big way, right? Um, I think by, by telling people the values that you stand for, the values that are Indian, and that you protect by telling everybody uh, in the rest of the world that India needs to go back to those values. You're doing the service. So thank you. I'm going to ask a question right at the back. Um, the gentleman in the corner in the glasses, uh, just behind the door. Thank you. And then I'm going to come to this side next. Hi, my name is Shoaib. I'm just a keen follower of the Indian politics. First of all, Raul, thank you very much for giving someone else the opportunity to become the president in your party. And the second question is, do you think in, uh, yes, to uh, implement your philosophy and your vision of the Indian politics, probably you need to win the elections. And for to win that elections, you need to defeat PJV. But do you think with Mr. Kharjan in, in, as a party president, you are well equipped to defeat BJP in the next elections? Look, uh, Mr. Kharge was elected as president um, in an in a election that took place in the Congress party. And he, he is the, the president of the Congress party. Uh, we're all working together to fight uh, the BJP. And I'm extremely uh, confident in Mr. Kharge's capabilities and his expertise. I don't know, I don't know if you know his history. Do you, do you know his history? Uh, I mean, he's been, he was a Congress worker. Uh, he's been a Congress worker for many, many years. And he's come up the ranks, and he's an extremely capable, dynamic person. So I'm very confident in his leadership. I'm going to come over here. Uh, maybe the gentleman at the front in the hoodie. Hi, I'm Sriram. I'm from, I'm a Chatham House member. I just wanted to ask you, sir, like, is there any type of new policy like how Jawaharlal Nehruji introduced the non-alignment movement policy? Like, is there any changes that you want to introduce in the Indian foreign policy? Uh, as I said, the principle, the principle of foreign policy is unfortunately self-interest, right? And any Indian government would pay attention to that. So in answering the question, The first step is, what is important to us as a country? Right? What, are we trying, what are we trying to do? And what we're trying to do is we were a rural country, and we are making a transition into an urban country. And this, this transition is, has a huge amount of energy, right? potential for violence, uh, but also potential for prosperity, potential for transformation. And we're trying to manage this energy as it's, as it's moving, right? If you look at our policies, they're all, or the UPA policies, they were all about trying to manage this transition from a, a rural to an urban connected country, right? So our foreign policy will follow that idea, right? Our foreign policy will reflect that, right? What, what, is, what, are, what would we, what would we like to do? We would like to build a society that's productive 
a society that allows our people to have uh, an imagination, to live happily, uh, to be educated, to have a certain amount of health care. Those are things that we would, that's what our imagination is. And our foreign policy will align with that. Uh, I've got a question online about climate change from Arita Segal, who says, what is your vision on decarbonizing India when China controls so much of the supply chain, I guess, for renewable energy? See, I mean, on the, on the climate change issue, interesting thing I noticed in the walk was that pretty much everywhere we went, they were speaking about climate change, but they were speaking about it locally. So they were saying, look, you know, it's terribly polluted, the water is very bad, uh, you know, it's got fluoride in it. But they were not making the connection between their local problem and the global problem, right? So I was thinking that it's important in India that we start to push that idea that this local problem is connected to the global problem. So that's, that's one, for one, one aspect of the yatra that uh, came out. On, you know, what is the vision for carbon? These things are not things that one person visualizes and suddenly says, you know, this is my vision for carbon. I mean, that would be insanity, right? Uh, the way to do it is you have a conversation with people, you have a conversation with stakeholders, and you say, okay, so what is the best way forward? And that's an evolving conversation. A lot of people sort of, they think that leadership is about, you know, <coughs> sitting there and just coming up with these ideas and uh, it doesn't work like that. It's about, it's about talking to people, understanding, you know, what the best, most optimal outcome is and then heading slowly in that direction. Yeah. Um, gentlemen here in glasses at the third row in the middle block. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ed Haron and I'm uh, just a member here. But I wanted to ask you was, I know there were a lot of conversations about the narrative being taken over by BJP and RSS views, and we spoke about the challenges India, uh, China has brings about. But I wanted to ask you, how does, would your views or Congress views differ from BJP's on Pakistan, and if there's any difference? I mean, my personal view is that, uh, it's important that we have good relations with everybody around us, right? But that also depends on the actions of the Pakistanis. Now, if the Pakistanis are promoting terrorism in India, that becomes very difficult to do, right? Um, and that, that does happen. And we've got time for one more question. I think the lady here in the fourth row in the, this block here. Last question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Varsha Vargas. I recently graduated from Savas University of London, and I come from Kerala. Uh, so my question is, during the Bharat Jodo Yatra, you mentioned you listen to many people. And as much as I value the importance of listening, when people come to you, they look as someone who's, who has a possibility of changing their lives or improving their lives. So. As someone who has a possibility of like becoming the future prime minister of India, what do you think? What actionable plans would you undertake? I mean, that's uh, okay. That's a very wide canvas you've given me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in what space? Um, like, yeah, this is something I could possibly improve, or this is something that I should do. If if there is an incident that has touched you or anything. In the yatra? Yeah. In the walk, a um, lot of women came up to me, and quite a few of the women spoke about violence that had been done to them. And in one of the cases, uh, well, actually in many of the cases, but in one particular case, I won't go into the details, but in one of the cases, I asked the girl, listen, um, she had been attacked, um, she had been molested, raped, and I asked her, listen, um, should we call the police? And she said, no, don't call the police. I don't want you to call the police. 
And I said, why don't you want me to call the police? You've come here, you've told me this, and now you don't want me to call the police. And she says, yeah, I don't want to call you to call the police because uh, then I will be shamed, right? So to me, that was a very striking thing, that here's this young girl who suffered this uh, violence against her, and now she cannot act on that violence because she's scared that she'll be shamed. So I was thinking to myself, this poor girl is now going to live the rest of her life, never telling anybody this. <coughs> and it's going to multiply the pain of what happened to her. So that is something I think I would like to change, that uh, the violence, the level of violence against women reduces, and particularly this idea that of shame, which is completely a ridiculous idea. Uh, is changed. Right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Thank you, Mr. Thank Gandhi, you. for your time and taking all, all the questions. I'll certainly do my best in future to not exist in the right kind of way and listen better. But yeah, please join me again in giving another round of applause to Rahul Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you so much.